If you are a fan of true crime like I am, then you may already be aware that many unexplained deaths and disappearances take place in the wilderness. In today's episode, we are looking at Dark Canyon, a 3.5 hiking trail in Malibu, California that acts as a type of Bermuda Triangle when it comes to missing persons cases. Today, we will explore the disappearance and death of Maitrese Richardson, and in the next episode, we'll discover how her fate may be tied to three other murders in the area. So grab your knitting or your vice of choice. My name is Sophia Talley, and this is True Crime and Knit. The beautiful Maitrese was born on April 30th, 1985 to parents Latisse Harris and Michael Richardson. Maitrese's mother, Latisse, had a troubled upbringing. Because of her absent father and abusive mother, Latisse was raised by her grandparents, Eddie and Mildred. This household was also troubled, and when Latisse was 12, she witnessed her grandfather shoot her grandmother before turning the gun on himself. Feeling like she needed a way out, Latisse focused on school. In high school, she met Michael, who was your typical bad boy, and became pregnant in her senior year. The two stayed together for a while, but in 1989, Michael was charged with an eight-year prison sentence, and in 1993, Latisse remarried and settled down in San Gabriel Valley, a safe suburb perfect for raising her daughter, Maitrese. Growing up, Maitrese had a larger-than-life personality. One of her mother's fondest memories from Maitrese's childhood was during her kindergarten graduation. When it was her turn to receive her diploma, Maitrese faced the audience of parents and faculty and then just broke out into the running man dance. Remember, this is somewhere around circa 1990, and the crowd just went wild. Maitrese was always a larger-than-life person that loved to dance and make people laugh. Though she loved to have fun, she was also very intelligent and driven. Her mother pushed her to do well in school, and if she got in trouble in class, she was made to wear this weird outfit to school that consisted of a romper and knee highs, and I just found that weird, but that was her penance, I assume, for you know, being the class clown that she was. But in the end, my Trace got into California State University, Fuller, and became the first person in her family to go to college. She graduated with honors and earned a degree in psychology in 2008. After college, Maitrese came out as a lesbian and was active in the local LGBTQ plus community. She participated in beauty pageants and went to Pride. At the time, she dated a boxer named Tessa, but they broke up in 2009. Maitrese decided to try something new and became a go-go dancer at Deborah's Club in Long Beach, which was a local lesbian club. She only worked part-times on Fridays, and her dancer name was Hazel, and she was also interested in modeling gigs. She even was a guest model at a Playboy Mansion party. Matrice was just having a lot of fun, but her family was concerned about her lifestyle. She sometimes took shady modeling jobs from people that she did not know, and her father was concerned about her falling into the wrong crowd, which is a very valid concern when you are part of the local party scene. And though Maitri seemed comfortable in her life, she began struggling with her mental health. First, Maitri became obsessed with a woman named Vanessa who frequented the strip club. The feeling was one-sided and Maitri actually showed up uninvited at Vanessa's birthday party in Las Vegas and of course she was asked to leave and then my tree started posting strange messages on MySpace. LA Mag quotes one of these posts have you ever woke up at 7 a.m crying on a Saturday because now you see the light you see all the people lost in the dark welcome to my reality 
end quote. These erratic messages got worse and her mother became concerned about her and her string of weird messages. And when Latrice asked if she needed help, Maitrice replied, I'm writing a book, my journal, because you told me I can be anything I wanted. You told me I was Miss America. You told me I was America's next top model. And now you know what I want to be when I grow up? Miss Mother Nature, because Miss America is a fake bleep joke along with everything else we see. So I'm trying to find my way to Michelle Obama to see if she will talk to Mr. Obama about creating my position within the White House. She went on to say, I feel joy, mommy. Not everyone has to die to live. I heard in the Bible, Jesus dies so we can live forever. Now I prove the unlogic. End quote. So yes, my trace was not doing well during this time and her family was really worried. But before anything could happen, tragedy just strikes. And before I continue, join me as we have our first knitter mission of the season. Okay. Hi, everybody. So first things first, welcome to season two, episode one. I cannot believe I am making season two. It's just amazing. I'm glad I'm not the only one that wanted to hear true crime and knit all in one spot. And this show just really helped me meet some really amazing people. And it's just so much fun to, well, the subject matter isn't fun, but the community afterwards is fun. So just thank you for being here for our first knitter mission. I'm going to talk about this season's pattern. And for those who are new who weren't with us last season, every season I try to have one of my patterns as our like official season pattern that we can work on together and post on my discord, which is in the show notes. Um, And this season, I've decided that we are going to do my drunken Netflix and chill throw. And the reason why I picked this throw that I just wrapped around myself, if you're watching, is because it has been part of my set pretty much since I moved the podcast to my office. And it just makes my really plain white futon I don't know. It just gives it a nice cozy vibe. And because it's behind me in every episode and because I've gotten questions like, what is that throw? I decided to release the pattern. And then I was like, you know what? This this pattern really uh, reflects my show a lot. It's just it's like in almost every episode. So I just had to include it as this season's pattern. And I can't hold it up because it's just so big. This throw is meant to lay on a full or queen size bed. And so I'm going to show you pictures of it. And this throw, believe it or not, takes only one skein of yarn. It uses a yarn called Lion Brand Cover Story. um, And it takes one skein. And believe it or not, you only cast on 80 stitches. It is super duper easy to knit. In the pattern, I included photos of the stitch motifs because there was different stitch motifs in the throw. And and the knitter can choose where and when and if they want to use the motifs. And it's just really cool. Like you could pick a basket weave. You can pick different garter stitches, eyelet stitches. There's just a lot of cool different things that I included in there but I included photos of each motif so that way if you would like you could plan out and kind of see what you want your throw to look like so you're not just in the dark um so this pattern I started writing it a while ago it had to been last year and the reason why I didn't release it yet was just because I just wasn't sure if if it was ready and I'm happy I waited because the the longer it took me to release the more I was adding to it and the more I decided to add more photos I decided to add more sizes there were two sizes in the pattern and so yeah that's exactly what So yeah, in the end, I'm happy I waited a year. I always found that if I wait a year for my patterns and if I really like 
baby it and work on it and work on it and just go like, just return to it I always find things that I would like to fix or improve upon so because of that even though it's just a simple throw it is one of my favorite patterns yet because I use this throw every stinking day and if you would like to knit this pattern with us I'm going to have the link to where you can purchase this pattern on Ravelry and on my website in the show notes I'm also going to have the link to the discord where we'll talk about knitting this pattern together I'm um, literally it takes one skein of cover story but you can use any type of chenille super bulky yarn I really hope you guys enjoy enjoyed this season's knit and I really hope you guys enjoy this season's episodes. I literally like this story right now. I've been researching the story for a couple weeks. It, this is a long story. <laughs> so anyway, let's get back to the story. On September 16th, 2009, Maitrice went to work at a freight company where she was an executive assistant. Her co-workers claimed that she was in an unusually good mood. After her lunch break, Maitrice failed to clock back in. She stopped by her grandmother Mildred's house that afternoon, and then later there is evidence that Maitrice visited her Aunt Lauren's house. As someone has posted her hazel cards all over the front of her aunt's house like in their porch area and I think when they say hazel cards I think they mean like her modeling cards and then she left a note on her uncle's car so Lauren's husband's car saying I TM as in trademark uncle Johnny Jimmy black woman scorn moi as in kisses, like moi. And that's what her note said. And I really don't think anyone really knew what that meant. Um, that night, Maitrice went to Jeffrey's, which is a fancy restaurant in Malibu. And while waiting for the valet, she actually got into the valet's own personal car. And when she asked what she was doing in his car, she said it's subliminal. And she asked him to keep an eye out for her. And remember, Vanessa was the woman she ha was previously obsessed with and pretty much stalked all the way to Vegas. As she entered a restaurant, the valet warned the hostess about Maitrice and her odd behavior. Maitrice ordered an extravagant dinner of a Kobe steak and a cocktail. And she was very lively the whole time. She actually joined a table with other patrons and they seemed okay with her presence there. But when the guests at that table left, Maitrice tried to leave as well. But the manager stopped her and asked her how was she going to pay for her $89 bill. And Maitrice claimed that the other table should have covered for her, but the manager wasn't buying this explanation. Maitrice then admits, I'm busted. What are you going to do? And she told the manager that she was from Mars and she offered to pay with sexual services. And she even pulled out a joint for some reason. The police was called by another employee who warned a dispatcher, and this is a quote, she sounds really crazy. She may be on drugs or something, end quote. While waiting for the police, Maitrice began to explain herself further. She told a hostess that at work, God spoke to her and told her to take the rest of the day off. She told her that she did not have any parents, only her grand grandmother, Mildred. The hostess called Mildred, which... Side note, she did not have to do, and Mildred offered to pay over the phone, but she couldn't pay without authorizing the credit card via a signature, which is just so unfortunate. And at this time, Mildred was 90, and she just felt helpless in the situation. When the police arrived, they actually spoke to Mildred as well over the phone. And I don't know what exactly was said, but I just found that interesting that they tried to keep my Teresa's family in the loop at the very beginning of this whole ordeal. So the police began to investigate my Teresa's case. They searched her car, which was very messy, but they could only find traces of marijuana and open bottles of alcohol. And so they decided to do a field sobriety test on my trees, but they found that she was completely sober. 
She did not have a record whatsoever, so my cheese was just charged with defrauding an innkeeper and possession of marijuana. At the time, my Trace's mother, Latrice, was told that her daughter would not be released until the next morning. She thought that a night in jail may teach my Trace a lesson, and the police assured Latrice that her daughter would be safe. Latrice told the police... And I quote, I think the only way I will come and get her tonight is if you guys are going to release her tonight. She definitely, she's not from that area. And I would hate to wake up to a morning report. Girl lost somewhere with her head chopped off. End quote. And just remember my Teresa's mother's fears because what she has to say uh, is just turns out to be incredibly uncanny and really creepy later on. And so my trees was sent to Lost Hills Police Station, which by the way, is a very foreboding name. I want to stop here and say that because the police found that my trees was not under the influence of drugs or alcohol, and because her reported odd behavior, I don't know why they didn't just drive her to a hospital she was clearly in a crisis and needed medical attention and police actually have the ability to have someone admitted to the hospital if they are deemed a threat to themselves or others and though my trace wasn't violent she was clearly a danger to herself there was also been some criticism towards jeffrey's the restaurant some felt that they should not have called the police but I honestly don't know what else they that they could have done. Really, it's up to the police and my Teresa's loved ones at this point. The restaurant doesn't have any responsibility for her. And I'm not saying that she should have been arrested, but she really should have been detained and evaluated at a hospital, which again, the police had every right to do with the way she was acting, but they didn't. Um, so while in jail, my trees attempted to call Mildred and police claimed that it looked as if she was just having a conversation with someone, but Mildred later claims that she did not talk to my trees at all after their initial phone call at Jeffrey's. So my trees could have been talking to someone else or she could have just been pretending to talk on the phone. We just don't know. And surprisingly, my trees was released from jail that same night on September 17th at 1228 a.m. A spokesperson for the L.A. County Sheriff Department states she exhibited no signs of mental illness or intoxication. She was fine. She's an adult. She had been invited to wait in the lobby, but declined. End quote. And though my Trace was an adult, she just wasn't feeling well. She was clearly in a mental crisis. And on top of that, the police impounded her car, which contained her wallet and cell phone. Just that fact alone just shows that my Trace just wasn't fit to be allowed to leave on her own in an area that was strange to her without transportation or means of communication. Usually the police cannot make you stay without a charge, but in this case, the police were well in their right to detain my trace under 5150, which is code that allows the police to, and I'm quoting Family Education Resource Center here, 5150 is the number of this section of the Welfare and Institutions Code, which allows a person with a mental challenge to be involuntarily detained for a 72-hour psychiatric hospitalization. A person on 5150 can be held in the psychiatric hospital against their will for up to 72 hours, end quote. And so my trees left into the night on foot. And the thing is, this station is not in a town square with resources and people. The closest open business was a mile away and was not in eyesight from the building. The only buildings that my trees could see in the area were closed commercial businesses. Because again, it was midnight. I just don't understand where they would have thought she she would go um, one officer claimed that she said that she was that a friend was going to pick her up but how would a friend pick her up if she also said 
she was talking to her mother. Like, I, she never spoke to a friend. And they knew that. So I just, there's a lot here that I just don't understand. I don't understand. And I don't think we will ever understand. As you will see later, it was really hard to get even close to the truth, let alone at the actual truth. And so the sad thing is, only a few years prior, in 06, this same department arrested actor Mel Gibson for a DUI. And instead of letting him go off on his own like they did my trees, they actually gave him a lift to his car. And the treatment was night and day. And Mel Gibson is the one with criminal intent. He was one driving under the influence. My trees didn't really do anything. She was just mentally ill she just had something wrong it's it's not the same thing at around 5 30 a.m that morning latrice called the police to check in on her daughter only to find that she had already been released and then latrice inquired about when she could file for a missing persons report because she's been released but she hasn't seen her daughter and deputy kenneth bumgardner is quoted as saying i would probably wait till you know early this morning and if she doesn't turn up you can certainly call end quote a lot of people disagreed with bumgardner telling latrice to wait to do a missing persons report because as we all know the first 48 hours of a crime like murder or disappearance was very critical so to tell someone to wait when the person can be injured, stranded. Remember, she was just left to walk off on her own, essentially in the middle of nowhere. Um, the this, this situation can go from just dangerous to deadly really quickly when you are walking by yourself in the dark or what if you're stranded somewhere. I mean... I hated that they told her to wait. And so I just want everyone to know that if you ever have to file a missing persons report, just do it. Don't don't listen to them when they said wait until the person turns up. Just do it. It's they're just trying to get out of doing it because a lot of times the person just turns up on their own, especially when it's an adult. Anyway, an hour later, the Lost Hills Department receives a call from Bill Smith, who used to report for KTLA 5 News. Bill claimed to have spotted a female trespasser in his backyard, who he described as a slim black woman with, quote, Afro hair. And Bill asked the woman if she was OK. And she said, I'm just resting. When Bill went back to take another look at the woman, she had already disappeared. It is believed that this woman was most likely my trees, who was trying to find her way back home. Two days later, the police began their search for my trees. Of course, if you are a true crime fan like I am, then you already know that two days later is already two days too late. We all watched the first 48, okay? We all know that evidence is harder to recover the longer you wait. And I just don't understand why the police weren't more proactive here. It is literally their job to protect and serve. And in my Trace's case, they did neither. The search for my trace was a long and grueling process. Firstly, LAPD was deemed to be the official department in charge as my trace was a resident of LA during the time of her disappearance. The police started the search at her last known location, which was Bill Smith's house. They were able to trace her scent and they could see footprints in the ground that suggested that my trees was running but they lost her scent at the dark creek area which is adjacent to dark canyon then like most disappearances the police had to sift through an abundance of false leads including one that led them all the way to las vegas when a high school friend of my trees claimed to have seen her at a bar and this lead took them absolutely nowhere. On January 9th, so four months after my trees disappeared, LA County Sheriff Department led one of their largest searches yet. They searched by air, ground, and creeks and trails all over a 18 square mile area. They only allowed volunteers who were trained in search and rescue ops to participate. But despite this, their search came up 
empty. Meanwhile, Mitrice's family was not satisfied with the police work. And first, they wanted to see the police's department surveillance footage from the night that Mitrice was arrested. Remember that the last confirmed sighting of Mitrice was while she was at the police station. Because even though she was sighted at that news reporter's house, that was only a speculative sighting. It could have been anyone. It could have been someone else. So it only makes sense that her grieving family would like to see the footage because there may be some evidence in there and it may give them more insight to where Mitrice may have went or if the police's account of the evening was actually accurate. At first, the family was told that there wasn't any surveillance footage from that night. Captain Thomas Martin of the Lost Hill Station actually stated to Surfside News, there is no video or tape of any kind. Now, this is just wild because it is a police station and of course they have surveillance cameras and they may not still have the footage months later, but at one point there would have been some footage. So my Teresa's aunt Lauren and two other loved ones actually sat down with Martin and another sheriff and during this meeting Martin allegedly admitted to having the surveillance video in his desk drawer. Suspiciously only weeks later Martin was promoted to commander and transferred to Monterey Park. This is weird because he lived closer to Lost Hills and coincidentally he was replaced by Captain Joseph Stephen who happened to also be Lost Hills first black captain so that is just extremely sketchy behavior he lets this big ball drop and tell them that he has footage of their daughter and he's keeping it in his desk and that he hasn't shared it with them and then after that happens only a few weeks later he is replaced and to me, it just sounds like they are in damage control. And it is a shame because if they acted this fast when it came to finding my trees, all this drama wouldn't have to happen. If they were just transparent from the start and show those tapes, you wouldn't have to allegedly upset the whole dang force. Transferring people and hiring people, all you have to do is just tell the truth in the first place. Finally, in April, the police gave my Trace's family permission to view the tapes. There was yet another problem. The video was clearly edited with several cuts as if the police cut out specific scenes. This made the family even more suspicious because they rightfully feared that the police were hiding something. But here's the thing. Edited surveillance footage in this case is not that uncommon. It is often done so that way the more important information is showcased and it just condenses what could be hours and hours of surveillance footage. Just like in the case of Relisha Rudd from last season, there was about a one minute surveillance video of her walking through a hallway. There could have been more to that footage, but it maybe didn't show Relisha's face or it wasn't necessary to show to the public. So that in itself is not uncommon. However, they weren't showing this case to the public, but just to her family members who would be willing to watch a much longer video. If it just meant to get some closure and some understanding about what happened that night. But there was one part of the video that terrified the family. A couple of minutes after my tree sleeps the station, an officer also got up to leave and walked in the same direction that my trees left in. It is implied that he did not come right back into the station. When the family asked who this officer was, LA Sheriff Department wouldn't talk. My Teresa's father says in reference to this footage, this guy leaves the building right after my daughter and they don't tell us anything about him. He could have abducted her, offered her a ride to the impound lot, left her for dead and come back for her. Maybe he didn't see her. The point is, why have they been hiding him? It's their job to get off their donut eaten bleep and find the truth, end quote. 
Finally, someone at the station spilled the beans off the record and told the family who the officer was in the video. But at first, the deputy in question was actually transferred to a different location six months after the family saw the footage. This could have just been a coincidence, by the way, since it was so long after the family saw him on the footage. But oddly, the officer is quoted as saying to L.A. Mag. The night this nonsense happened, I was one of the guys that kept away from this, minding my own business, end quote. I just don't even know what to make of this quote. It could imply that something strange did happen that night, or it could have just been terrible wording on his part. I mean, just calling that whole night nonsense and saying that he was trying to keep away and mind his little business it just makes me think something did happen and we just may never know and again it could have just been a really really poor choice of words because of all this opaqueness and hostility from the police the public began to speculate that my trees may have actually been attacked or raped by the officers that night as they were the last ones to have a confirmed sighting of her And the public became rightfully angry at the police because remember, this is in the L.A. area. And I swear anytime LAPD or a section of LAPD like this is like the L.A. County Sheriff Office. So it's it's like it's not the city police department, but it's like the county department. But anytime LAPD or any of its like branches pops up in a case, I feel like ironically saying make a wish because LAPD have literally decades if not a century of botching cases corruption and police brutality towards minorities under their belt from the Black Dahlia to Rodney King to OJ Simpson there are just so many cases high profile and lesser known that were just you know jacked up LAPD is actually revisiting some of their botched cases as we speak right now and so they are at least trying to fix this reputation and better themselves but only time will tell if they would stick with this or if they will go off the rails again so to me it's no surprise that the public is questioning the LA Sheriff Department's innocence and they are wondering if they should be suspected as well especially since people rarely just vanish without a trace I mean it may seem like that if you follow true crime but honestly people are generally easy to track down especially someone as bubbly and outgoing as and beautiful as Latrice I just can't imagine anyone forgetting her if they encountered her somewhere while this was happening there was still volunteer searches for my trees being conducted by friends and family one search party was led by Maurice Dubois the father of Amber Dubois. In February 2010, 17-year-old Amber Dubois was sexually assaulted and murdered by John Albert Garner III while jogging in the Lake Hodges area in San Diego. Her body was recovered from the lake in early March. Because of the similarities in their tragedies, the two families leaned on each other and supported each other. So it was Amber's father's search group who found racially charged murals depicting nude black women, some who looked like Matrice, freshly painted on a concrete drainage culvert. So just so y'all can visually picture this, a culvert is a large concrete wall with two small tunnels at the base of it. Well, it can have any number of small tunnels, but this particular culvert had two small tunnels at the base of it. And the tunnels allow for water to drain away from a certain area. And on this wall is just this lewd painting of black women with big round afros. And above the tunnel, it says, enter the afro. And the artist wrote on the right of the wall in the center of painting there is a black woman coming out of a certain part of the human anatomy and on the ground the artist spray painted land of the afro and you can view this mural at your own risk in the show notes but I just want you to know it is disturbing and the more you look at it the worse it gets and I'm gonna try to put it not safe for work blur on it as well because it is pretty graphic and it's ugly yes I said it it is an ugly painting and the artist needs to work on its color theory and anatomy skills now anyway this mural is located close to the house of Bill Smith and remember he was the retired news reporter who spotted a woman 
fitting Maitreese's description, resting in his backyard. It is generally thought that someone painted it in hopes that the search team would find it. So yes, yeah, someone most likely painted it for clout and most likely made the women in the mural look like Maitreese just for attention. You know, a lot of weirdos come out with dumb ways to get attention during a missing persons case. Usually it's just a false tip or by creepily inserting themselves into the search. But this is the dumbest cry for attention I've ever saw. And I'm just going to leave it at that and not give it any more of my attention. But also in the months following her disappearance, my Teresa's family filed a complaint against LASD with the Office of Independent Review. And the Office of Independent Review essentially work to investigate police investigations. They're a private entity that is used for this purpose. Before the official report from the Police of Independent Review was made public, though, there was a break in my Trace's case. On August 9, 2010, two rangers were patrolling through the rough terrain of an abandoned marijuana farm that had been raided by authorities three weeks prior. They followed a creek that led them away from the farm, and this is where the two rangers made a sad discovery. In a creek that ran through a bottom of a canyon was the naked body of Maitreese Richardson. Her skull was separated from her body and sitting upside down, and her body was beginning to mummify. Eleven months after her disappearance, Maitreese Richardson was finally found, and this discovery just left us with more questions than answers. To make things even more chaotic, remember when I mentioned that the Office of Independent Review was investigating the police's involvement in Maitreese's disappearance? Well, right after her body was discovered, the official report was leaked. The Office of Independent Review did not find any fault in the way the L.A. County Sheriff handled the case. This was found despite the fact that Maitreese was clearly a danger to herself and was in desperate need of medical attention. The investigation that followed was haphazard at best. First, the coroner's office was not notified for a full 90 minutes. Because of the location of the body, investigators had to be airlifted onto the scene. Oddly, the police officers were airlifted first, while the coroner had to wait six and a half hours until they were able to be on the scene. And by then, get this, this is a first for me, the police actually took the remains themselves from the scene not the coroner, the police took it before the coroner can investigate. And despite the fact that they are not supposed to do this because, you know, that's not their job, they even bought the remains back to the station. Because again, this is not their job. They completely botched this by leaving behind some of my Teresa's bones and by completely destroying the death scene. I mean, everyone knows not to move the body. And everyone, the public, the family, and other L.A. police officers just wanted to know, what were they thinking? Why? Why did they do this? The L.A. Sheriff's Department seemed to have an answer for everything but that, though. The coroner was unable to determine the cause of death. But don't worry, the Sheriff's Department jumped in and said that she most likely died from oak tree poisoning or a rattlesnake bite. The thing is, there is no solid evidence that humans can die from oak tree poisoning. Usually only livestock and animals, things like that, are affected by oak tree poisoning. And only two people in California die from rattlesnake bites per year but say if this is true that would mean that my trees would have been able to climb through the rough terrain without proper gear and died in a creek oh and remember how my trees was found naked well the la sheriff department also determined that animals had removed all of her clothing that night my trees was wearing a belt tight jeans, socks, sneakers, two shirts, and a bra with hooks and underwear. And all of her clothing was found intact and undamaged. Firstly, 
there are still humans on this earth that cannot unclip a bra. I wear one every day and I struggle. I don't understand how an animal like a raccoon could have finessed all of her clothing off without damaging it and then throw her clothing into the canyon. One of her items of clothing were actually hanging over like a tree as if it was placed there by someone tall enough to place an item of clothing there, not a raccoon. There was also problems with the way her body decomposed. She was beginning to mummify, which needs a really dry or an extremely cold climate. Definitely not a creek in the comfortable L.A. area. But there was one speculation that the police may have gotten right. While searching my Teresa's car on the night of her arrest, police found a handful of handwritten journals. Police had these journals analyzed by mental health professionals who believed that she could have been suffering from bipolar disorder. The thing is, if my Therese was suffering from bipolar, then why didn't the police notice? Why did everyone from the valet to the hostess who are not even trained in working with mental health cases notice what the police couldn't? At the time, the county sheriff was Lee Baca, a dirty cop who is now serving three years in jail for obstructing a federal investigation. He was also known to beat inmates. Baca was in charge of the Lost Hills department that let my trees go in the middle of the night in the first place. But with a corrupt man like Baca leading things, it's clear that, that the public was never going to get the truth in the first place. It's just sad. If only someone else was in charge, then maybe we would have had more information at the time. Maybe my Therese would be alive today, happy on her medication and enjoying her life once again. That's the part of this story that really digs deep into my soul. All that was needed was a psych eval. If the police had just had her evaluated, my Trace will be alive today. In late 2010, Latrice met with Sheriff Baca to request that her daughter's remain be exhumed and re-examined. Baca claimed that the FBI agreed to this and agreed that Mitrice's case looked like a homicide. Baca promised to add a wanted alert on the county's website, and he also promised to post a reward for any information leading to any breaks in the investigation. Surprise, surprise, though, Baca never did this, and the FBI said that they never told him that they agreed to exhume her body. In 2011, my Teresa's parents were awarded $450,000 each in a wrongful death lawsuit against the L.A. County Sheriff. In 2015, the family asked the Office of the California Attorney General to review the case. Our current VP, Kamala Harris, was the Attorney General at the time, and in their review, they didn't find any fault in the way that the police handled the case. But in 2016, they reopened the case again and they concluded that there was insufficient evidence. And so that is the case of Matrice Richardson. It's a case that really goes round and round. And when it stops, you are in the same exact place that you were when it started. I really want her body to be exhumed and examined outside of L.A., I want the family to use a private coroner because as you can see, the people that worked this case just could not be trusted. Whether it was incompetence or foul play, we may never know. My name is Sophia Talley and this is True Crime and Knit. For more information, including show notes and sources, please visit www.thedrunkknitter.com slash true crime.